If you follow the world of comedy and Netflix stand-up comedy specials, you've probably seen or heard the chatter about Nanette, an intentionally nonsensically titled special by Tasmanian-born comedian Hannah Gadsby that, depending on who you ask, is either an unfunny lecture devoid of laughs launched by an angry, vindictive lesbian who wants to destroy comedy forever, or a glorious, medium-redefining masterpiece that will change the way you think about the very concept of humor because it's an unfunny lecture devoid of laughs launched by an angry, vindictive lesbian who wants to destroy comedy forever. You may think I'm being hyperbolic, but the reaction really has been that extreme, with the special Anne Gadsby herself alternately celebrated and attacked in equal measure with language that suggests nothing so much as the social justice left having finally found its own answer to the late great Sam Kennison. So imagine my relative surprise, coming it must be said, from my own position of relative privilege and general unfamiliarity with Gadsby's previous work, at the time at least, in sitting down to watch the thing and discovering that this supposed cluster bomb of stand-up comedy antimatter was something so normal and approachable. That is, of course, until it no longer wants to be, when Gadsby tips her hand as to the true nature of her set, but that's the whole point. To be sure, there's an element of staginess and even, for lack of a better word, pretense to the proceedings. At first glance, the logic behind the title, she started out trying to write the entire special around an encounter with a barista named Nanette, realized that there weren't any jokes there but kept the name, has an insufferable Wes Anderson-esque quality at first, and the narrative arc of the show carries the same whiff of theater student overreach. What if a stand-up comic announced that they'd come to hate telling jokes in the middle of their sect and were quitting comedy, but then just kept going anyway? But then she does keep going, and you realize she's actually going to stick to landing, and that even with the aforementioned point being that Nanette isn't, strictly speaking, only a stand-up set and features more than just joke-telling, the best joke it gets off might be the demonstration of how much controversy can be ginned up simply based on the teller and tone of the joke apart from the joke themselves. See, at one point early on, amid a segue from describing the professional comedian's toolbox of repurposing everyday annoyance and embarrassment for humor and half-seriously lamenting the lack of stand-up comedy use for her seemingly wasted art history degree, Gadsby begins to rail against a tendency of culture to fetishize performers and artists suffering from mental illness as a kind of creative gift. Zeroing in on an obnoxious acquaintance, pontificating about the often repeated falsehood that Van Gogh might not have painted his flowers so spectacularly if he'd been medicated for his schizophrenia. Seized on the opportunity to put her personal and academic knowledge to use, she describes a verbal evisceration of the blowhot in question, correcting him that Van Gogh was in fact seeking treatment at that point in his life, that he didn't see his mental illness as a creative aid, that the doctor treating him was one of the subjects he painted, and that the medication he was taking to help his condition was actually known to have side effects involving the perception of color that could in fact be the actual explanation for the vivid way he perceived and painted the world in its colors. It's a righteous mic drop moment to borrow the language of the profession, even as rendered in Gadsby's own soft-spoken Aussie accent and measured middle school teacher diction, but what occurred to me as it reached crescendo is that everything about the bit, from the liberal arts degree subject matter to the medicine and doctors are actually good, you pretentious asshole subject, to the overall nerdy book smarts as triumphant beatdown framing felt exactly like the kind of stand-up most beloved by the fans most incensed by Nanette's apparent existence, except, of course, for Gadsby herself. This same routine, repeated in a snarly, confrontational masculine register, perhaps spiked with reference to Jenny McCarthy or whoever the anti-homeopathy pseudoscience punching bag of the moment was, and perhaps a callback to a psycho ex-girlfriend who believed in healing crystals or some bullshit, would be a guaranteed instant classic bit from the seemingly endless wave of Dennis Leary, Bill Hicks wannabes who tend to catch fire among the I-fucking-love science crowd. Hell, speaking of which, a subsequent riff on the absurdity of gendering pink and blue as colors when considering the actual behavior of those hues in nature, chemistry, the light spectrum, color theory, would be right at home in the also thoroughly uncontroversial dad jokes plus astrophysics realm of, say, Neil deGrasse Tyson's Twitter feed or a Brian Griffin riff on Family Guy, but I imagine you get the idea. Now, that's not to say that Nanette isn't boundary-pushing and quietly revolutionary in its own way. After all, it sets out to be exactly that and largely succeeds. But one of the key things it ends up illustrating is that Gadsby might as well burn down the stand-up scenes, and she's clearly going to be framed as doing so anyway, even if she did stick to standard-issue, pissed-off, over-educated millennial material that would be otherwise right at home in a dozen college-town open mic nights. Of course, it would be disingenuous, to say nothing of a disservice to the material itself, to suggest that Nanette owes its polarizing reaction entirely to the teller and not to the story, though pitched as a stand-up special, it's really more like a one-woman variety show, wherein Gadsby segues, sometimes abruptly, sometimes gradually, always with a point, from straight stand-up set to TED Talk-style lecture on the mechanics of joke-telling to soul-bearing personal essay that spins off from introspection to self-criticism at sanitizing her own life story at comedic consumption and into an indictment of comedy culture for demanding it before snapping back into different jokes entirely and, well, things that are decidedly not jokes as well. In terms of other comics, the approach is probably most similar to when stand-ups whose set incorporates music performance think early Steve Martin with his banjo, Adam Sandler's guitar rock, and the arena shows of the early 90s, the myriad vaudeville and lounge acts who also sang or played piano, would slip a serious number into the set for effect, except Gadsby's instrument remains only her voice, and her serious number is a set-length interrogation of the stand-up scene itself, and her frustration at inhabiting it as a gay woman expected to deliver a certain amount of, as she glumly groans out the words, lesbian content. En route to her point, she ultimately opts 
pops to shatter two of modern, here meaning post 1960s, stand up comedy's ultimate taboos, questioning the act of recounting tales of one's own personal failings and humiliations for the amusement of the audience as a therapeutic act for the comic, and more unforgivably, revealing that such stories can be exaggerated, embellished, or even stripped of their own actual truth in the name of getting a laugh and indulging the crowd. A single example of this forms the long game gut punch of Nanette's dramatic arc. This would be the spoiler, folks. Having let off the all jokes opening act of the show, we right before the part where she says she has to quit stand up comedy and things get a little bit serious, with a lightly amusing anecdote about having been threatened by an angry man for flirting with his girl, only to see the would be attacker back off upon realizing Gadsby was in fact not a rival man, but rather a not especially feminine woman, the punchline, of course, being that she was in fact flirting with his girl after all, haha, -ha, jokes on him. As an example of the audience friendly, easy laugh lesbian content she's tired of doing, she returns to the story near the more righteously angry conclusion to reveal her finishing blow, that the process of making that experience into a funny story for mainstream stand-up audiences involved leaving off the real ending, that the angry man realized his mistake a minute later, returned and violently beat her near unconscious while multiple onlookers provided no aid or rescue, and she was only 17 at the time. It's an extreme case, which she acknowledges, but to be certain, by the time it arrives it comes backed up by a well-made case that in Gadsby's view the supposedly mutually therapeutic audience comic relationship of life anecdote stand-up isn't all that mutual for comics who are already themselves living marginalized lives, and while being able to laugh at herself may be one thing, she no longer sees reframing such stuff so that most of these straight audiences can laugh at them too as an act of sharing her pain. Rather, she contends it's more like giving them permission to laugh off something they already didn't take seriously. It's not hard to see why that sentiment is anathema to so many comedy fans and plenty of fellow comedians' entire sense of self. After all, stand-up as opposed to clowning, slapstick, and other forms of performance stage comedy was born of self-effacement as its fundamental stock in trade, developed and nurtured by mostly Jewish vaudeville pros who recontextualized the classical downbeat irony of their cultural theater tradition into a mainstream palatable hard luck aesthetic that today forms the bedrock of Western adult humor. With rare exception, the stand-up comic tells you an embarrassing, degrading story about themselves, which can be defined pretty widely, everything from my marriage is miserable, to I'm socially inept, to my priorities are so askew I spend time thinking about airline food, and invites you to laugh in recognition, sure, but also simply at them and at their pain. As for comics who also happen to be women minorities and part of the LGBTQ community, that's always meant something of a messy trade-off when playing to mainstream audiences. You're sharing your truth and welcoming them to laugh, but you also know some of them already just see a clown. It's no accident that the so-called stand-up boom of the 80s and 90s neatly paralleled the emergence of gender-ethnic parity elsewhere in society, i.e. suddenly ordinary middle-class white guys also had a social displacement to feel perplexed and anxious about, whoa gender politics at the office, am I right, fellas? But in saying these things out loud, Gadsby is in some way breaking the stand-up rules even more subversively than copying to the lie in her mistaken identity anecdote because she's breaking all the tiny, silent agreement contracts between marginalized comics and mainstream audiences, to be publicly embraced as a reward for being public in an acceptable way, to have one's anger celebrated so long as the audience is invited to join in and not simply bear witness, to have surviving pain affirmed, providing the audience is absolved of any guilt for having caused it. More than anything, Nanette's aim is fixed on the notion of therapeutic confessorial stand-up as a transitory exchange, the idea that contextualizing their unique experiences and the familiar rhythms of just my luck, how huh, folks, white male comic boilerplate, marginalized comics are not only bearing their souls and letting in the sun, they're allowing the normals in the audience to understand the pain of the other as a reflection of their own, the romanticized self-ideal of the mainstream attendee of the late-night stand-up show, laughing in surprise, recognition, wiping away tears between the applause, thinking to themselves, wow, I don't think I ever really understood the heartache of a gay person struggling against their own societally ingrained self-disgust to come out to their parents, but now that I've heard it sound exactly like the awkward self-hating arguments I had with myself about telling mom and dad I was changing my major, I can relate so much. No, Gadsby through Nanette effectively ends up saying, you can't, and she's tired of propping up the stand-up formula fantasy where minorities and the marginalized must be one part group spokesperson and one part funhouse mirror reflection of the broader audience, and even as she's ironically vastly less confrontational of her audience itself in tone and language than most conventional stand-ups of the moment, the accusatory implications cut clearly through. I really do have to quit stand-up comedy, she keeps repeating as a transition from subject to subject, though how absolutely she really means this appears to be an open question, and you, the demands of the mainstream audience, the standard world at large, and Swate Wrightman especially, are the reason she's so damn tired of the whole thing and needs to get out. Except she can't, or at least the other subtextual joke seems to be that the desire to tell truths in the form of funny stories has a stronger pull than her own self-preservation, which of course would be another trait she'd share with quote-unquote normal stand-ups, or most of them. The I need to quits or segues into digressions on serious pain, sure, but they're also outros to asides about the obscurities Gadsby would rather riff on if the medium would permit her to abandon self-deprecation. She's not kidding that she could get a whole set from her art history background. There's a whole other kind of nerdy transgressiveness to an extended bit that starts out on her disdain for cubism, overrated, zeroes in on the cult of Picasso specifically, segues into a slapdown of his historically downplayed misogyny, and then soars up into a unified theory of the two points, with Gadsby 
be dismissively declaring, yeah, we can see every perspective at once, great, but none of those perspectives is a woman's, and a rejection of the mantra to separate the artist from the art. At the core of it, the point Nanette keeps returning to is Gadsby's revelation that, in spite of all she's managed to accomplish and survive, she's still beset by a sense of shame and self-hatred, what some might even identify as a form of imposter syndrome, that continues to haunt her and, as she tells it, led her to interrogate her earlier self-deprecating material, the aforementioned lesbian content. As much as softening and editing her anecdotes were lies for her benefit of the audience, she was also lying to herself that the benefit reflected back onto her, i.e. the last and greatest myth of the stand-up contract, that it's okay for the audience to laugh because getting to tell the story is healthy and cathartic therapy for the comedian just doesn't hold true. For people who exist where society places her, she matter-of-factly explains, the expected self-deprecating humor that generally plays as humble for a straight male comic isn't humility, it's humiliation, and she's not going to make humiliation, hers or others, okay for the audience anymore. But even amidst all the talk of quitting and deconstruction, I'm inclined to feel like it's diminishing in its own right to either elevate or decry this one woman and her one woman show as a wrecking ball here to sweep traditional standoff off the stage of history. For all the hand-wringing Nanette has inspired, it's not as though Gadsby spends any length of her time calling out the material of other specific comics, as did beloved firebrand Bill Hicks at one point, or trotting out entire genres of joke-telling for mockery, which was a huge part of Andy Kaufman's live sets. Indeed, the point she keeps returning to isn't stand-up needs to be destroyed or even just upended, it's that the rules and expectations governing a medium created by for and around straight white men isn't a space where she feels she authentically can fit anymore. How anyone else should feel about it or what they should do isn't really part of the show. Writing for Vulture, in one of the many, many pieces lauding the net as the grand reordering the stand-up comedy demands, Matt Zoller Seitz contrasts the special's originality and boldness with his decidedly less enthusiastic appraisal of Bill Maher's most recent offering, Live from Oklahoma, describing the aging, grouchy, real-time host railing against the political correctness of younger millennials as representing comedy's past as much as Hannah Gadsby represents its quote-unquote future. Writing in the piece, if you segue from Oklahoma into Gadsby's Nanette, you'll hear lines that sound like direct criticisms of Marr and other comedians of his ilk, men who worked for decades to acquire platforms they now possess, yet seem to take them for granted and are rarely caught pondering politics, except as it relates to their ability to get primo bookings they believe they're entitled to. Gadsby says that whenever she's mistaken for a man, she feels briefly grateful because, just for a moment, life gets a hell of a lot easier. She warns there's too much hysteria around gender from you gender normals, and tweaks the can't-you-take-a-joke brigade by asking why is insensitivity something to strive for. Now, as attention-grabbing comparisons, to be sure, it really hits, but it's one that I think overlooks the fact that Mars act, really the act of every left-of-center but anti-political correctness comic who came to prominence in the 90s, was always fundamentally backward-looking, even when it was new. Indeed, like all the others toiling in that style, an entire generation of middle-brow talents who wanted to copy Bill Murray but settled for impersonating Peter Venkman, Mars' righteous, angry poise never really stopped being that of the frustrated, late-period boomer male annoyed to discover upon reaching his 20s that the best-of-both-worlds manhood promised him by JFK, Sinatra, and Hugh Hefner, the one where the nominally progressive-minded straight white man was still the presumed ruler of the world, head of his household, architect of all culture, free and clear to speak any opinion, take any number of martini lunches, and flirt with any secretary at work, but also not be held guilty by themselves or anyone else for the patriarchal sins of their forefathers by dint of that nominal progressive-mindedness, was not, in fact, waiting for them. Instead, the secretaries wanted promotions, and their black friends wanted to be more than their black friends they perhaps wanted to be their black bosses. I mean, what's up with that, fellas? Am I right? In the end, the more honest subtext to that era of rage against political correctness comedy was always less about the erosion of free speech and more about, whoa, 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 wait a minute, guys, I thought we had a deal. Voting for Democrats, supporting Roe v. Wade, and not using any of the really bad racial slurs was supposed to mean I get some leeway on being an asshole about other stuff. What happened? Hannah Gadsby and Nanette aren't what make Bill Maher feel like an angry old man. Being little more than a standard issue performer from a generation of edgy comics where being a young man with the grievances of an angry old man was the working definition of edgy did. Nanette is a hell of a comedy special, or whatever you feel it should be categorized as. It's funny, touching, smart, enormously well-performed in stage, and it has fascinating, biting, and often hilarious things to say about art, culture, shared humanity, and the medium of comedy and stand-up itself. And all of those things are more interesting, and offer more interesting discussion, than some hyped-up doomsaying a grave dancing, for that matter, over whether or not one lady comic has burned down the whole village by asking the audience to stop and take stock of what they're laughing at, and why.
Hey gang, here's a question that keeps coming up. If your handle is Movie Bob, where are your movie reviews? Well, my old reviews are in a lot of places. You'll find many of them on my YouTube channel, but you'll find the brand new ones on Geek.com, an awesome site that's also your one-stop news source for science, TV, gaming, technology, nerd culture, the works. You can find all my reviews directly by going to Geek.com slash author slash B. Chapman, because that's my real name, and you can get regular updates on all my reviews and all of Geek.com's other great content by signing up for their kick-ass newsletter at subscribe.geek.com. And don't forget to also subscribe to the Geek.com YouTube channel, where you'll find the videos that accompany my reviews and tons of other great content, too. Remember, that's Geek.com, the Geek.com newsletter, and Geek.com on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss out on all the latest Movie Bob reviews. You can also check out my own new website, Movie Bob Central, where you'll find my blog, links to all my work, and shop for my books, ebooks, and future Movie Bob products. And please remember to like these videos, share them with all of your friends, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching another Movie Bob production.